gonna concentrate. So what we are gonna study is the is the physics. If you wish, physics and mass of massive gauge bosons. irrespectively of the phenomenological details, okay? And that means we are gonna concentrate anytime we want to learn the basics, we start with the minimal structure. That's how learning should proceed. So we take U1 gauge theory. And if MA is non-zero, this is called the Proca theory. As opposed to Maxwell, when it's zero, and we found out that's very easy to do. All you have to take is a Maxwell Lagrangian and add a master. What to learn? First. That of course there must be only three degrees of freedom. This is a spin one field. The fact that there are three degrees of freedom implied a condition which we derived from the equation of motion d mu a mu equal to zero. And then we got that each of the components satisfies a Klein-Gordon equation. This is not a gauge condition. This is an equation of motion. Fair enough. We have no problem dealing with this in the, in the momentum space from X going to the P space, which means that from A mu, we go to epsilon mu as a function of P now. We perform a Fourier transform as usual and get the polarization tensor. We found the form of the polarization tensors. And, and uh, of course, the equation one, well, let's call this one and let's call this two. So one meant that epsilon mu P mu, a constraint on the polarization tensor is zero and two simply that E square, I understand this Persian relation. M is a mass. We can call it MA here consistently. Yeah. And we could even de derive the propagator. We found out that the delta mu nu of A of the Proca field, let's call it Proca with the usual Normalization as Maxwell is P square minus M A square, which respect as in the case of Klein Gordon. And the polarization tensor was G mu nu minus P mu in your MA square. And we found out that this fits with what we expected. The Klein Gordon degrees of freedom propagating from our three spin one states. Everything is okay, a perfectly well-defined theory, which we, we show that we can study the, <coughs> the whatever aspect, including the decay rate of such particles, and that's gonna be your homework. But we were troubled, troubled. By the propagate. Why? 
we can smell the trouble without going into nitty gritty because delta mu nu broker goes to one over ma square when p goes to infinity not good obviously you don't have to know anything almost about field theory to appreciate this by not vanishing since quantum field theory is about calculating loops with the propagation of such massive gauge bosons if they exist the fact that this does not vanish but goes to the constant we said will imply that the integrand doesn't vanish enough. We have to compute <coughs> the, the integrals of the type. There is an integrand which is a function of p. And for this to be finite, then it has to be finite. We need that i of p goes to zero when p goes to infinity and it goes fast. And that's not happening, okay. This is a fundamental problem of the Broca field or massive gauge boson. And this has been the obstacles for years in the development of the standard model. From 1961, with the pioneering work of Gleshow through the 1967, eight, the Weinberg, Salam work. There was a problem, there was no way of computing They realized that they couldn't compute loops and they got stuck. Okay, Weinberg spent years of his life, the problem will be resolved in 1971, more or less, by a Hoft. And it's interesting because in the process, Weinberg himself wrote precisely the standard model, not just a generic property of the Higgs mechanism as Salam did in that, in that classic work. The solution, of course, will be the Higgs mechanism that I'm going to teach you here. But they all got stuck because at the end, independently of how you get it to be massive, there was a prevailing feeling, OK, whatever you do, it's going to be massive it's going to look like Broca. I will get this propagator and that's going to drive us crazy. And my task now is that in a span of a few weeks, well, now we are going fast. We'll see how, how fast that I convince you actually that there is a way out. Higgs mechanism. You know, I don't, I don't have to teach you this historically. Higgs boson has been found, so you can say, why, why in the world are you bugging us with some Asian history that for us means nothing? To, I want you to appreciate that at every stage, this is remarkable, but at every stage, the theory preceded experiment when it comes to modern particle physics. That's fascinating. Also to, to, to appreciate the, the theoretical evolution so that we can face the, the task which is ahead of us, the future, okay, we want to understand. So I don't want to just start with what has been observed. I want to, I want to take you there. It, and that means that what we have to start today is spontaneous symmetry break. Spontaneous symmetry break. We'll have an acronym, which is SSB. It's a fundamental part of, so let's call it SSB. When I write SSB, I'm referring to spontaneous symmetry break.
Anything that you want to ask or comment before I move on? As usual, the first 10 minutes or so, I'd like us to remember what we've done. And now we are gonna move along. We are starting something completely new. And I will do the illustration. When I say spontaneous symmetry breaking, that means that there is some symmetry I'm talking about. Symmetry gets broken. This is what the meaning is by the ground state. Or what we call vacuum. We often say vacuum in field theory, the ground state. So don't be uh, alarmed when I use vacuum. That's just the expression for the ground state. Strictly speaking, it may not be even vacuum. There may be something there, but the name stuck because it was imagined that the ground state should be completely empty. No energy, no charge, whatever. So in other words, we have a perfect situation. There is a beautiful example by Salam, for example. Salam says, imagine that we are at the round table. So we are at the round tables, we are seated, all of us. It can be really us going for dinner. And then we have a glass. Each of us has a glass. And it's on the left and on the right. Because it's to the left to you and the left to the person next to you. So it's also on the right and so on and so forth. There is a perfect symmetry. And until the first person picks up a glass, usually, you know, if there is no well defined regulation that you should go left or right, that's, uh, that's usually the VIP, that's someone very important. If you had a dinner with Salam, Salam would be the, the, no matter who was around, he was a man of great importance, and even the way he behaved, he would pick up the, uh, say on the left and everybody else would pick up on the left. So first class picked up break symmetry. There will be a, an example. You can imagine this example. Imagine that you have a mountain and two valleys and you put a big ball on the top and there is no friction. This is perfectly symmetric, you agree, but the ball will fall down if there is no friction, either left or right. Once it falls down, let's say if it falls down, here the symmetry is broken. This is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. Everything is symmetric, the situation starts with, but the ground state is not. You've seen many examples like that, I'm sure. You can take an elastic rod. And exert force on it. You exert force on it here and it will bend, right? It's completely symmetric around the Z axis. There is a symmetry here. This will be a U1 symmetry, a circular symmetry, but it will bend. It will bend somehow. Once it bends, you break symmetry. We have again spontaneous symmetry break. But what we need is the field theory example of having a vacuum that breaks the symmetry. I'm going to start with the simplest possible, the simplest system. By the way, here you capture all the features. So pay attention now for the next few, whatever, 10, 15, 20 minutes. I don't know how long I will take, maybe more. Simply system that I can imagine in field theory, I take a real scalar field. And I take the symmetry to be discrete, phi going to minus phi. Z2 discrete symmetry.
And then I write the most general Lagrangian, which is very easy. It's the kinetic energy, obviously, minus the potential. Kinetic energy is manifestly invariant. If I want the potential to be invariant, I expand the potential. V of phi will have this form A phi plus B phi square plus C phi cube plus D phi to the force and so on. I can keep expanding it. We have to stop at the dimension four, otherwise the theory is not well behaved. If this is not completely clear to you, just imagine that this is an example, but actually is the fundamental aspect of quantum field theory. And therefore, if there is a symmetry, there can be no linear term and there can be no cubic term. My most general potential, we have quadratic and quartic term. To emphasize it from the kinetic energy, remember in the units, H bar equals C equal one, taking into account that action is D4X Lagrangian and is dimensionless in this units, of course, H bar equal one. I find out that the scalar field has a dimension. What is it of mass? We will always use unit of mass from now on when I speak of, unless I specify. What is the dimension of the scalar field? You have done this? One. Because the derivative is one over the length, which is mass. Lagrangian has to be mass to the force. Okay, this ensures the dimension of the Lagrangian is four. So when I integrate, I get one. Simply because length has a dimension of length is minus one in these units. Okay. So I can write the potential like this. Mu square phi square. Mu has a dimension of mass plus lambda phi to the force. So dimension of mu, of course, is one. This is a master. And dimension of lambda is dimensionless. It's dimensionless. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. By the way, let's establish immediately what we know. Immediately, I conclude, this is the first point, that lambda must be positive. That guarantees that the potential is bounded, that there is a ground state. in order to have a finite field ground state. If lambda is negative, of course, the minimum will be at phi equal to infinity. Lambda equals zero would imply it's, you would fall into the abyss, phi going to infinity in the vacuum, and that's not good. Okay, so lambda must be positive. This is very important. I don't know about mu square. At first glance, you and I will conclude that maybe mu square has to be positive, but I don't want to assume anything. Let me put plus or minus, and then you and I will study. To make our life simpler, let me rewrite the potential just a little bit. I can now write the potential like this, if you don't mind. <clears throat> I can take the following potential, <clears throat> sorry. 
as lambda over four. Let me now normalize it with my convention. I will keep, it's just a normalization. And then I will write phi square plus or minus V square, everything square. Why? Because this is lambda over four, phi to the fourth, plus or minus lambda over two, V square, phi square, plus lambda over four, V to the fourth. I've added a constant. This is just a constant. And the constant has no impact on the equation of motion. So this is the actually the same potential. <clears throat> there is an equivalence here. Potentials are equivalent. Is that clear, please? No, <clears throat> notice that with these conventions, mu square is simply proportional to lambda v square. So what is the dimension of V? One. One. This is the only dimension for quantity. By the way, this is not the Higgs mechanism because this is very simple. The Higgs mechanism has to do with gauge series, but all the aspects of the Higgs mechanism or symmetry breaking in general are captured on this example. So, it's very important that you pay attention now, including even the existence of the Higgs particle, surprisingly enough. So in other words, if, if this is the only dimension for lambda, it tells me that all masses, whatever I have, I don't care which particle we add to this, will be proportional to V. This is very important because it's dimension full. Okay. So let's study it. So I have a potential. So, okay, so this is my potential. So I can start, let's start. Let's try it once again. Lambda over four, just a normalization over four. Nothing important here. <laughs> I have two possibilities, A, Choose a plus sign. That implies V is lambda over four, phi square plus V square, everything square. And it turns out, I don't even have to say anything that the value phi zero equals zero is the minimum. of the potential, agree? Obvious, the bigger phi square, the bigger the potential is three. So nothing really happens. This potential would look like this. And it would just look like sharper parable, depending how big lambda is. And the minimum is here, obviously. And notice that the symmetry of the ground state <clears throat> in this situation, we have no symmetry breaking. Because why? Because there is still Z2 symmetry of the vacuum. This is not very interesting. And this is what we are used to. Now let's just comment on this, however, before we go on. Let's just understood that in this potential, but let's, let's a few words more. Oh, by the way, let me introduce an interesting fancy concept. M0 
I will call it a vacuum manifold. It sounds very fancy mathematical. And vacuum manifold, it's set of all points so that V of phi zero is at the minimum. In this case, M zero is just one point. This is a point, a trivial vacuum manifold. But let's, let's understand what it described. This Lagrangian, however, is one half d mu phi square minus the potential. So it looks like this. The potential is, is minus one half lambda v square phi square minus lambda over four phi to the fourth. There is also a constant. I don't care. Notice just the, let's take the free Lagrangian. No interaction. And remember lambda V square is some um, master mu square. What we get here, if I integrate by part, Lagrangian will be minus one half phi box plus mu square phi, the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian, which tells me that box plus mu square acting on phi is zero. And that means in the momentum space that minus p square plus mu square is zero which means that E square is P square plus mu square. Einstein, this is a perfectly well-defined physical sphere. By P square, of course, I will always mean P mu, P mu, unless I specify. So it's a perfectly well-defined Klein on the field. There is no symmetry breaking. This is the normal situation that you have been Standing all your life. Any student of field theory starts with an example like this. Sometimes complex, but the point is the same. And this was always thought to be the only way of interpreting the theory, that there was no option. Because the second possibility, which we will now study the potential, is the following lambda over four. phi square minus v square was thought to be wrong. And we can see it immediately. What would this imply if I take this? It will be lambda over four, phi to the fourth. Let's write it once again, minus now uh, lambda over two, v square, phi square, and minus some constant. I won't even write, I don't care. Would imply the following, that now that mu square, okay, what would it imply that I have a free Lagrangian? In other words, the free Lagrangian would be one half d mu phi, d mu phi minus and minus become plus, plus mu square over two phi square. I've changed the sign and therefore I will get, I don't even have to write for you, the t square is p square minus mu square. We get something that will be a tachyon, a completely unphysical object if for thought. So people got stuck here something that moves faster than the light. Okay, totally unphysical situation and imaginary mass. And this was the stumbling block. People got stuck here for long years. This is no good, you say. But then 
I put a question mark. Well, let's investigate it. Let's be a little more careful here. Let's go back to square one. Let's write the let's write the potential. Let's study this potential. Maybe we were rushing too much. What is the vacuum manifold here? Vacuum manifold is set of all points phi zero, so that the potential is the minimum, which of course is zero. This is a positive definite, semi-positive definite potential. So that's all the points phi zero. So that phi zero square is equal to V square. This is a set of two points plus or minus V. It's now non-trivial. We have a non-trivial M zero. Let's plot the potential, it's very easy. I've chosen the constant, you don't need it, the constant the way I chose it, but I just, I took the potential to be positive definite because it's much easier to see what the minimum is. I don't have to study the second derivative and so on. So I know that the minimum is plus or minus three. When phi is very large, this potential grows. So it must go like this. At minus V, it must be zero. But it is positive, therefore it will grow here. Now zero, of course, is a local maximum. It's not a minimum. The potential it looks like. The example I took before. precisely this potential of the mountain and two valleys. Phi equals zero is now is a local maximum. The thing, however, is we said, oh my God, but this is a tachyonic field. It doesn't make sense to talk about this potential at all. Well, the point is the following, that in field theory, that in the physical system we described, we will do perturbation theory. And that's what we always do the way we do in QED. In other words, we look at the small oscillations around the minimum. You choose one point, okay, phi zero. It should not matter which one you choose. Let's take phi zero Goran is plus V. You can take minus V and you will see that you get the same result. And you will study the behavior of the system that moves around this minimum. In other words, phi is not a physical field. Phi describes the motion around here, but this is a, a, a local maximum. I don't want to live here on the top. I fall down immediately. So really the phi is equal V plus H, where this is a physical field. Oh, or it could be a physical field. I can't argue immediately it's a physical field, but I should look at this field to see whether or not it makes sense, it's master and so on and its interactions. If you choose, of course, minus V, you will then perturb around minus V. So it's a side remark. If you choose phi zero to be minus V, then you would write phi minus V plus H and everything will go through. Since the situation is symmetric, of course, physics can not depend 
which point I take. You can imagine this as some kind of left-right symmetry. If there is a symmetry between left and right, then of course, it's just a question of name, what I call left and what I call right, as it is in this case. So let's rewrite the potential now as a function of h, lambda over four, v plus h square, phi square, minus v square, everything square. It's lambda over four, v square, plus two V H plus A square minus V square. A very important thing, the troubling V square term with the wrong sign actually disappears. Notice what we got. We have an interaction, which is lambda over four, H to the fourth, fourth plus lambda V H Q, another interaction when I expand. And finally, the mass term, which is lambda over two, no, lambda over four, sorry. Yeah, I can write lambda over two, sorry. No, I can do better. I can do maybe more elegantly. I can write one half and then two lambda V square, H square. What happened? This is the interaction that we had, which is symmetric under Z2. This is a new interaction because we introduced a new field <coughs> and this interaction breaks Z2. This is very important. <coughs> very important here. The symmetry is broken, of course, <clears throat> that I expected because once I leave, whereas the system is perfectly symmetric, the ground state breaks the symmetry once I leave near the... Uh... And now we have a mass term. You can call it mu square. Notice it has a perfectly sensible plus sign. No tachyon. <clears throat> All it took is that I realized that the field phi is not describing the physical situation of moving around the ground state. The fear of a tachyon was the choice of a wrong variable. There is an interesting, you know, Weinberg is a, is a sort of tough and serious man, but he has a very good dry sense of humor. I wish I can find this. He's got some kind of review as he's giving advice to young people how to do physics. And there are a few important suggestions. One of them is Weinberg. Weinberg says, Make sure you choose right variable. You see, it's not just this is this is obvious, right? I mean, this this is not an advice. It's make sure. Sometimes it's easy, of course, when you work with a spherically symmetric system. Otherwise, he says, you will regret your choice. You will live to regret your choice. And you will see when we do the Higgs mechanism, why Weinberg says that, because he took a wrong choice and for five years he got nowhere. He was just choosing wrong variables at Hofwood change the variable, sometimes it's that simple. And this is a nice illustration in this extraordinary simple system 
In order to understand what is going on, all you have to do is choose the right variable. It's not just choosing the right theory, right principle, right idea. That's how it starts, but there is more to it. You need the right variable. And of course, we all wish there was a rule of how to choose the right variable then of course, but it would be dull because then physics wouldn't be a, an art of solving problems. Questions, please. Notice that this H, by the way, I will call it here Higgs field. There is no Higgs mechanism, no gauge symmetry, but it captures the essence. I call it Higgs field because this will happen in the Higgs mechanism. And what it means that when you symmetry breaking, when you have symmetry breaking, that V is plus H, the this mass of the Higgs field is two lambda V squared. There will be a massive particle whose mass is proportional to the scale of symmetry break. And the proportionality is the interaction constant. By the way, you knew that, you know that because V is, is only dimensional non-zero parameter. So MH must be proportional to V, that you know. What is very interesting that it's proportional, in other words, however, there is more to it. MH is proportional to V, but also MH is proportional to Lambda, to the interaction constant. This will be a generic future feature for every elementary particle, we will see. Every particle mass, every, whether it's an electron particle, elementary particle, every mass will be proportional to V and the interaction constant. We are capturing it here in this simple example. Of course, it's trivial. There is just one particle. So you're saying this is trivial. However, I want you to be ready. This will happen in a beautiful manner for every particle. If it's a gauge moson, the coupling constant will not be lambda. It will be G. If it is a fermion, it will be some other coupling constant. We call it Yukawa and so on and so forth. But the feature is captured here. Questions, comments. I'm going over it. Can we get a chance to see if you missed on something? If it was really that clear. I mean, it seemed very convincing what I said, right? Let's go over it once again. Let's hear me say it again. In this particular case, this is what we are interested in going back and choosing the uh, the symmetry breaking potential. See, the whole thing was here, the opposite sign. Everything is here in the sign. 
it's amazing how much of the rich Higgs physics will be just associated with the sign we said. It was trivial to draw the minimum. There were two points. And then I said, you and I have to live around the ground state, right? That's convincing. And I said it with authority. So you, you, you know, if my professor said it with authority, then it's got to be true. And remember the way uh, I actually did it on purpose. I said, you and I. But you and I are classical objects. Elementary particles and the fields that correspond to them are not classical objects. I actually cheated here. What I said at first glance is completely wrong, but none of you objected. What happens in quantum mechanics? Let's go back to quantum mechanics, which you studied a lot. And I give you a potential like this. Double well potential, what will happen? The tunneling. Sorry? Tunneling. They, they will be, say it, say it. I, I couldn't hear. Uh, tunneling. 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 Tunneling, tunneling, sorry. Tunneling, yes, of course. You don't live here, you just tunnel through. Remember the, if it's point A to point B that you have to, uh, remember in the WKB approximation, just to remind you, the probability to tunnel the rate for tunneling, if you remember, it's e to the minus integral from a to b dx, and then the barrier, call this v0. If you have zero energy, it will be just v0. <clears throat> so it depends how far you are, and it depends on the size of the barrier. If the barrier is finite, the tunneling probability is finite, and you just tunnel. The ground state here, ground state, the vacuum or ground state. So now if you know that there will be tunneling, why didn't you tell me that there will be tunneling? It's interesting. It's symmetric actually. You don't live here. You live in both equally because you tunnel. So am I wrong? It seems I'm wrong completely. This is a double well potential with a finite barrier. <coughs> well, the point is that this is true in quantum mechanics. However, in quantum field theory, when you have infinitely dimensional problem, it's sort of all of the you know, space time, you have to, here you have just X coordinate. It turns out that gamma is zero for tunneling. The theory of tunneling, I don't have time to talk to that, but I have to tell you, I, had, I decided to be honest. Sometimes I don't even say it, okay, today I felt I should say it is the following, this has been studied by Okun, Kopsarev, and Zeldovich. In sometimes in the 70s, I don't remember. And then it was elaborated in a theory of so beautiful paper by Coleman and collaborators, also 70s. The theory of tunneling with the following conclusion. It 
Imagine that you have the following situation. That you have the broken degeneracy. So this is the lower vacuum. This is really the, the ground state. This is you would call false vacuum. It's only locally a vacuum. So if you start here, you will of course tunnel. That's not surprising. And you find out the gamma of tunneling is proportional to E to the minus. <clears throat> there is also the distance from one from point. This is phi one and phi two. E to the minus, there will be integral and you will be, I don't want to bag your details from the points to phi one. The crucial thing is that that will be proportional to the barrier, call it V zero, divided by the difference delta V to some power. You're not learning this here, please relax. I'm not teaching you anything, I'm just citing this. This he derives, this is derived when delta V is much smaller than V zero. Small vacuum energy difference. And you get the suppression because somehow the whole of the field at least of the safe space time has to tunnel and that's highly suppressed. So in other words, when delta V goes to zero, gamma goes to zero, E to the minus infinity. And it goes pretty fast, no tunneling. So the result is, I'm just citing it please, so that you know that this is a true phenomenon and we can go on. No tunneling between the generate vacuum, not in field theory. One dimensional system like quantum mechanics, yes. It's a profound theory, the theory of tunneling. Very interesting photo. Yes, it, you have to create a phase transition. You know, the way the water turns into vapor, you have to get a bubble. What happens is, okay, what Coleman shows, you get a bubble of new vacuum inside. You start with a false vacuum. Somehow you found yourself there. Then what happens is that the bubble that gets created of the true vacuum has to grow and it has to grow very fast, otherwise it will collapse and so on and so forth. You know, in a, it's, it's really a beautiful uh, word and some of you may wanna read it and then I will give you the literature. But for today and for the rest of the course, all you have to know is that you can trust me. This is true. So, um, Let's do the, uh, let's have a break so that you can pause and think about this. Uh, unless you wanna ask me something now. I will move on. I want to be sure that you grasp it. So this is 11.57. Any question? Let's be sure that everything is clear. I to ask you a question. Yes, please. Okay. Um, there was a part where you said five because of V plus H. So you said the H is the physical feet and the phi is the, is the non physical feet, right? Right. And V is just a number. Like, I mean, the average value of the field in the vacuum state, right? Right. So we call it. We call it, let me just give it a name that you're asking, vacuum expectation value. I'm just wondering if... Or rev, let me just say that V is something that I call phi zero. I will often write it as phi 
if I think of the quantum field, it's the value of the field in the vacuum. Yes, please. Okay. So, like saying that P is just an ordinary number now, how can something which is non -num, which is how can two things which are not numbers, one is non physical and is equal to one which is physical? What is not physical? <clears throat> you said H is a physical field, right? Right. Phi is not a physical field, and V is just a vacuum expectation value of the field. Right. So, like, I'm just, I'm what is the nomenclature that is confusing me? Something that is not physical is equal to something that is physical plus a constant. Well, remember, if there is no tunneling, I don't know if I will say it any better. I'm, I'm, I'm worried that I may repeat myself. If there is no tunneling, if you agree with it, then you and I have to leave somewhere. No tunneling, right? We accepted this. You, 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 you trust me. Or Coleman. Okay. We agree on that. You tell me that yes, you agree. So phi describes the motion around here. Of course, it can make the whole difference. The field that describes the motion here is the so phi is describing. So phi is motion around v equals zero, which is a maximum. And you cannot live there. You fall down immediately. H is motion around phi zero equal v, which is a minimum. And the only difference between the maximum and the minimum is some constant. By the way, the, the the, the, the value of this constant is not really physical because I can always renormalize it. That's the way I wrote my fields, okay? Remember that the, the, the mass of the Higgs field, the thing that is physical is mass of the Higgs field, which is two lambda V square. And you can renormalize lambda, renormalize V. So V per se is not physical. V depends how you normalize your fields. You could write V over square root of two the way you wrote and so on. So it shouldn't really bug you. I think it shouldn't bug you because strictly speaking, V is not physical. So phi will not be physical. Only H is physical. H is describing the motion around the, the minimum. By physical, I mean, what do I mean by physical? You see, by physical, I mean that, that that it describes the particle of a well-defined mass. I mean, in a sense, you know, strictly speaking, they are both mathematically okay, phi is okay. So, so the, the field that describes the motion here will be a tachyon. Here, there must be a tachyon because what is the mass? Think about it. The mass is the second derivative of the potential, mass square. After all, the mass square is the second derivative at some point. Mass term is defined at some point. Call it phi i at phi point i. Mass term tells you whether you live on the maximum or the minimum. So Yes, the only difference between physical quantity, which has a m square positive and the unphysical one is just the distance in the space. I, I can't say it better. It's better now. It's okay. You can, if you're keeping trouble, you know, we'll keep discussing it and I will always try to say it in a different manner. At the moment, I think the best that I can say is now. And, and to keep in mind, you know, when you read books, <laughs> people tell you that V is some physical number. People tell you, oh, V in the standard model you will read is 246 GV. I don't know, they will give you some number. This is a side remark. And then you read in some book, someone says, no, it's 174 GV. You know, what does that mean? That they normalize it differently. Okay, let me just anticipate. In the standard model, you will see that MW is G times V. 
This is physical. This is a method of normalization, both of these. You can change your normalization of G. It's up to you that will change normalization of E. Okay, if I'm making you feel better, this is good. Any other quick question? Otherwise, I suggest as usual, I need a break to uh, pause and to see whether I've told you everything. I have to make sure also to see whether you will come up with a question. So let's meet in about, let's make a round number. So let's meet at, at, at 12, 10, say. I strongly suggest you, you know, to, well, you may go and make a coffee or something, but it, it's, 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 I cannot offer you a better advice than to think about what I said, because there may be a question may emerge. Okay. If you don't ask me anything now, you will ask me later. I will, I will with this, I finish the spontaneous symmetry breaking of this discrete symmetry. Okay, meet you at 
Okay. We are back. Any questions? Another example, now much more interesting here where the dynamics enters the discrete case. It was kind of trivial. The example of continuous global symmetry, U1. I'll take U1, but this is true in general, what I'm gonna say for any non-abelian system also. It's called often a goldstone, it should be really called a Nambu goldstone mechanism. Nambu is the father of spontaneous symmetry breaking in particle physics. Starts with the work of Nambu in 1960. In 1961, in a series of beautiful papers, Goldstone elaborates Nambu's work. So what we have to do if there is a U1 symmetry first, the field has to be complex now, obviously, and it has to transform as E to the I alpha. Remember the transformation has Q, there is some U1 charge Q, and I can choose I can choose always when there is one field only, which I'm taking the Q phi is equal to one. So phi goes, I'm looking at the symmetry, phi goes into E to the I alpha phi. The reason I do the discrete example that everything is prepared that, okay, this is my U1, U1 symmetry, alpha is a constant. This is what I mean, global, it's a constant. Potential is very easy to write. The Lagrangian, of course, is the same as before, almost. It's complex, so I better make sure that I take complex conjugate and multiply minus the potential. And the potential, of course, it's very easy to write. It's the same as before, almost. Lambda over four is our normalization. I will stick to it. It's not phi square, but it has to be absolute value of phi square minus V square. To be explicit, it has to be phi star phi. If I write phi square, it would be main variant. This is the most general quartic potential analogous of the one before. Situation is almost the same. And of course, I'm going to choose the minus sign. I want to uh, uh, create a situation of spontaneous symmetry break. So in other words, the potential, look, if I write phi, I can write phi any which way I want. Now it's a question of choosing the variable. Then now, you know, we start facing the situation as in the Higgs case. Okay. So phi one and phi two, this potential has a form. or a Mexican hat, the famous sombrero, the Mexican hat potential, often called. Notice that along this line here, The potential is constant in energy. In other words, the MECU manifold now is at all points phi zero, so that V is V minimum. But I chose it on purpose. This is my adding the constant. Okay, I've chosen the constant, so at the minimum, the potential is zero. And therefore, this is, but I have the right to do that. This is the, um, all the points phi zero square equal V square. What is this vacuum manifold? Who can help me?
He was two points before. What is this manifold? A circle. Yes. Thank you. Situation now is less trivial. As before, if I work with this field phi, I will run into the same problem as before. You can imagine phi would describe the motion around phi equals zero, which is a local maximum. So I have to make sure now I'm forced to choose the right variable. And the right variable means that I choose a point on the, it doesn't matter which point because of the symmetry. Remember like before I took plus H uh, plus, plus three. Let me go back because I, I should have emphasized this before. When I wrote the Higgs mass, so-called Higgs, I mean, there is no Higgs. What did I get? It's two lambda V squared. Notice I claim that it will be the same whether it's plus or minus V manifestly, okay? Which is, I could have written, this is also two lambda minus V squared. A physical quantity should not depend which, which of the vacuum expectation values you take, if there is a symmetry, obvious. It's very important. So now you look up your point. And then you should say that my physical field re lives around it. It's a complex field, so I can write it as phi zero plus H plus G. And phi zero is a question of your choice. So again, I would choose say V. You can take V E to the either pi over four, whatever it should be. However, the following should be true that, okay, no, not here, I'm sorry choice of phi zero means the same physics. As long as you're on the vacuum manifold, you have to live on the vacuum manifold to describe the motion. You know, now that there is no tunneling that you and I know, all, we, all you, you and I have to make sure that I choose the field that lives around the ground state. Okay, so we take V. This I will take, let's, let's try to be as general as possible in this case, but let's try to say uh, what will happen. So what would I, what would the potential be? Potential will be the following. Maybe we should carry on bef before. So what do I have to do? I have to take phi zero, phi zero star, uh, phi five star. So that's phi zero plus V plus I G times phi zero star, no plus V plus H, I'm sorry. Plus H minus IG minus V square, everything square, right? This is Lambda over four. I get phi zero square. minus V square. Plus, you see, it starts to be massive, messy, but very important now you notice independently of phi zero that you choose, this is very important. You will get the, um, the discount of phi zero square is equal to V square. I would have H, phi zero plus phi zero star, am I right? Plus IG, phi zero star minus phi zero square.
and the um, I will now choose, now I go now, just to show you, you see, they will only get a quadratic piece for H, okay? This is very important that the, that the, that the constant term got canceled. I'm now gonna choose, and you should make sure that you agree with me. I'm gonna choose phi zero V to simplify the calculation. And this becomes lambda over four, two VH. What did I, I miss something? Uh, professor, sorry. Uh, why we don't take the H square and also the min the G square? Yeah, thank you. No, why you're, 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 you're <laughs> sure <laughs> I made a mistake. Oh. There is, I, you see, it's kind of messy. Okay, let me not write it here. I won't, in order to simplify it, because I know now you choose phi zero that you like. I'm gonna choose phi zero V and then I proceed. Because it got mess. I just wanted to convince you that the constant term will cancel, which, which is fundamental to get the correct physical masses. And then we will have two VH plus H square plus G square, everything square. Do you agree? Did I make a mistake again? I need you. You see, it's good that you are. Uh, I was, I was, I was wrong what I wrote before, but I think now it's correct. Right. There is no linear term in G, but only quadratic, which is lambda over four. We can write like this: h square plus g square, everything square. That's the first term. Plus lambda VH H square plus G square. Another interaction, we have two interaction terms. So this is interaction, this is interaction plus one half. Two lambda v square h square. What did we what did we get? We got the same situation. So this is our Higgs field, no Higgs mechanism, but I keep calling it Higgs field. The guy that they had a vacuum expectation value, so I put in uh, uh, quote unquote, and the same result as before. This is what I told you: the discrete guy captures everything. Again, proportional to V, that's the only scale, and proportional to interaction. This is the, I shouldn't call it the, the, the Higgs field, by the way, but, but it, it's very funny. It should be called Goldstone Higgs field, really. Goldstone noticed this in his beautiful 1961 paper. Goldstone notices Higgs will get a Nobel Prize for this. Well, he gets a Nobel Prize for the Higgs mechanism, but one of the things we associate the name Higgs boson with the Higgs, and actually it's wrong. The, the, the suggestive existence of the Higgs boson was already noticed by Goldstone. I'll tell you, this is an irony here. Okay, very interesting historic irony. And you will see why there is a confusion. I may be confusing you, okay? I will not be saying this anymore, but just for you to know. Um, what else did we learn that mg is zero? Notice that there is no mass term like g. This field g is called Goldstone boson very often. It should be called Nambu Goldstone boson. but it's often called Goldstone boson. So Goldstone got recognized for something he should have gotten recognized. There is an irony here. This field, the massless field that you get when you break spontaneously a continuous symmetry. As I said, it's often called Goldstone boson. 
And I have to even remind myself, knowing the whole history, history that Nambu already anticipated its existence. Simply Nambu says, without even saying this, it will, it will cost me no energy going around the, uh, around the minimum. Here it costs me no energy whatsoever. Here is, there will be no mass term for the field describing the motion along the equipotential surface. That's what the, uh, that's what happened. There will be, there is a sort of Goldstone theorem, by the way, what is often called Goldstone theorem was proven by Goldstone in 1962. Goldstone, Salam, and Weinberg. Complete what should be, what is often called Goldstone theorem. That says the following, if you have, if you break spontaneously, continuous symmetry, global, you get a massless scalar field. That we should call number Goldstone boson, we will often, uh, uh, And notice what happens. Let's be very clear here because we will be generalizing it. I said that phi goes as e to the i alpha phi. No, what, do I, what am I right? E alpha phi, which is u phi. I can write as u. This transformation u is simply to the i alpha. And then I can generalize it for non-abelian for as you do anything I like. This is my transformation. And notice what we are saying. I have chosen that phi zero is equal v. That means that u at phi zero is actually is, is e to the i alpha phi zero. And this is not phi zero. This is what we mean that the symmetry is broken. Okay. The transformation acting on phi zero doesn't leave it invariant. The, the symmetry operation. moves along the vacuum manifold M0. It doesn't, you don't stay at the same point. Just to remind you in the case of the discrete symmetry, remember, and the discrete symmetry phi goes into minus phi. So if you choose that phi zero is equal V, you get the discrete symmetry on phi zero would be minus phi zero. It, 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 this is what you mean by breaking the symmetry. The ground state is actually dynamical. It's not nothing because if it were nothing, you would stay into that one and the same ground state by your operation, okay? This was a side remark. This is not so exciting. This is a discrete symmetry. But going back to the continuous one, I could have written really, I can write, phi is e to the i alpha q. In general, there may be more fields and there is a charge associated with the transformation. So u really is e to the i alpha q in general. So what we are rating the q phi, I took it to be phi. This is just trivial, that's what I said, but that implies that q phi zero is not zero. Q phi zero is phi zero. It's not zero. You see what happens here? Charge does not annihilate vacuum. It 
In other words, vacuum is not a vacuum. Vacuum carries charge. This is very important. It's highly non-trivial, this vacuum. This is not electromagnetic charge. I just mean some charge, right? In nature, electromagnetic charge is not broken. We can imagine some other charge here that you like to imagine, okay, that is broken in nature. We'll talk about the examples in the standard model. Vacuum carries charge. Vacuum is not empty. This is the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, what happens is for semi symmetry breaking, Q breaks, Q is broken, we say. It does not annihilate vacuum. So the Goldstone theorem, whose proof was completed actually by Goldstone Salam, but by he anticipated. So the Goldstone theorem really. Goldstone theorem says every time when some charge Q, whatever is broken, which is equivalent to say that Q phi zero is not zero, you will have a number Goldstone boson associate. Q. So what I mean really, what I mean is that if you break seventeen charges, you will get seventeen number Goldstone bosons. This is what he says. If it's hundred twenty three, you will get hundred twenty three every time. We are gonna sort of, I'm not gonna prove the general theorem or maybe I will, I will decide later, okay? But I'll give you examples so that you see how it takes place. Examples are more eloquent than dry proofs. This is a fascinating dynamic the existence of this. Uh, we have not found a such a field. We don't know any example of a spontaneous breaking of a global symmetry. There are ideas that float around. People have suggested various such particles, but they have not been observed in nature, not yet. This is idealized situation. But notice an interesting thing that what is called the Goldstone boson, Goldstone didn't deserve to have this name but he actually discovers the Higgs boson. He notices this will be the Higgs boson every time some field phi has a vacuum expectation value. You see what we are learning from the discrete example. So just to summarize, the one, you know, G exists because there is a global symmetry, but whatever I do, whether it's a discrete symmetry or you want symmetry, or you will see any symmetry G, you will see when the phi field Vacuum expectation value is non zero. So that's say phi is V, we fix it. You will write that phi is V plus H plus whatever. The real part we will call V plus H. We will, we will show. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to do something. We will show here what follows that MH square is with our normalization to lambda v square. This seems to be generic field field and that's why I call H to be Higgs field, which will be true in the Higgs mechanism, but it's always true. Whatever symmetry you imagine, local, global, discrete, and so on, we are getting, we will do the other examples, okay, but I, I'm, I'm taking you there. I want you to notice that this is taking place. I don't know if you have questions, but I have a question for you. 
I have chosen in all these examples, so every example, well, all these, there were two, both in the discrete case and the U1, I used scalar field. My question, can I use, say, spinner? Can I use spin one half or spin one one field to illustrate this? In other words, can it be that the electron field, I don't know, has a non-zero vacuum expectation value or the gauge field? I'm asking a question. Would that be okay? The question is profound. I, I want to explain why I'm asking you because when people suggested a mechanism, there was no scalar fields. And maybe people claim that this will be wrong because there are no elementary scalar fields. There was a resistance, whereas there were elementary fermion spin half and spin one fields like the photon. Is this acceptable? Someone wants to try to answer this? I think it's zero for the speed. Why do you think? Because it has one. It has? Creation of, and creation and creation of resource. So that scalar field, what's the difference? I don't understand. All the quantum fields have. Yeah. Oh, it could as well happen. I could write some potential for the fermionic field that has a, uh, I could imagine that. What will happen in other words, if you wish, I can also ask you what happens, I can be more precise, if psi electron say is non-zero, what happens if a mu of the photon is non-zero? I just told you, what I told you, remember what I told you that if you have some field phi, whatever it is, and phi is non-zero, then you get that the symmetry will be broken. Of course, if phi carries the charge associated with the symmetry, there is some charge, or maybe even, even not say charge, maybe we can say it better. If phi transforms non-trivially under that symmetry, symmetry S, let's say, and the symmetry S. Okay, this is what we've seen in these examples. It's, it's obvious. Symmetry breaking means that somehow vacuum carries the vacuum expectation value knows about the symmetry and it's broke. So if the electron field has a vacuum expectation value or a mu has a vacuum expectation value, which symmetry would be broken? Either each of these fields Besides the, for example, in the case of the electron here, you would break charge. Q electromagnetic broken. You don't want to do that. But the photon here is no charge. So you can say, oh, I don't worry about charge. Something else would be broke. Lorentz symmetry. These are not Lorentz scalars. But Lorentz symmetry seems to be extremely well 
because it will be a disaster if I break the Lorentz symmetry at the scale of each interactions. I would have no theory. So you see, Lorentz would be broken. Any field that is non-trivial under, under Lorentz symmetry will break the Lorentz symmetry. This is why only scalar field can have non-zero. At the appreciable level that you and I can measure, of course, you can tell me maybe there is some small breaking of Lorentz symmetry that I'm ignoring. I'm speaking about the theory of the present day particle physics where Lorentz symmetry manifestly conserved. We don't want to break Lorentz symmetry. This is why, so in other words, this is why one introduces an elementary scalar field. People resisted a lot. They said there are no such fields, they were not observed. And by the way, it took a long time. This is 1961 Goldstone, 1964 Higgs. You know, you know when the Higgs boson, this elementary field was the true Higgs boson was discovered. You remember when? In 2012. And one of the reasons, okay, the uh, year was 2012. Throughout the time, even now, there are some people who think maybe it shouldn't be elementary. I stop at this point. Any questions? Seems not. Am I right? Okay. I hope it's clear. Then I see you tomorrow. Was it a question? No. No. Okay. Bye now then.